This is Taking the Lead, a podcast for B2B tech professionals, leaders, and executives who want to learn from female icons in the tech industry. In each episode, host Christina Brady interviews women who are driving revenue for some of the most respected tech companies in the world. Are you ready to get inspired? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Taking the Lead. I am Christina Brady, your host that loves talking to all of these iconic and incredible women. And today, we have a wonderful conversation lined up. I am here with Amy K. Hutchins. Amy K., welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Oh, it's going to be so much fun, especially I love that you're in a little bit of a different role and have a little bit of a different career path than some of those that I traditionally talk to, which if you listen to the show a lot, you know, I love talking to folks who are doing something a little bit different because I guarantee that your career path and what you're doing is the dream of so many people and how you got there and how you do it is going to inspire so many. So to kick us off, tell us your journey what you do, how you got there, the steps you took to get there. I want to hear the story. Oh my gosh. So, so when I was two days old, no, we won't, we won't go back that far. Go all but, the way back, all the yeah, way. We'll go all the way back. But you know what's so <laughs> funny is that I would never really think about it, except that I've been in sales my whole life, but not in a traditional sales role. So I started off as an elementary school teacher. And if you think about that, that is like the ultimate sales position because you're is, constantly selling them, right? Yeah. And so- Little did I know that that was going to be this incredible training ground for then becoming a teacher trainer and convincing them that there were ways, again, to buy into ideas and to do things differently. And then I literally transitioned into corporate sales, and I worked for a billion-dollar consumer product company. My territory was Asia, Australia, and Europe. And it was just, it was fascinating that a lot of what I had done with my fifth graders was working in sales. And it was sort of like, oh, I see this connective thread. So I joke that I've been a teacher my whole life. I mean, if you'd said to me 25 years ago that your career would end up where you'd speak on stage in front of like 5,000 salespeople, I'd be like, no way. And yet that's exactly what I've been doing my whole life is I've been a teacher and I've been selling ideas and learning my whole career. And, And here I am. And what's so beautiful about it, Christine, is that I still love what I do. I still love what I do. And that's so important in sales is to be genuinely passionate about what you do. Oh my gosh, I couldn't agree more. And I also, you mentioned teachers and the unbelievably incredible professions that teachers can hold after teaching if they're transitioning out. I think about teachers being wonderful working in enablement or any kind of training or any kind of sales or any kind of leadership. I really feel like as a daughter of a teacher, teachers can do anything. The other one, really good, servers and bartenders make incredible yes. salespeople. <laughs> yes, they do. Right? And, and I always joke, like, it's like, I could never, I could never be in business like where you sell the tequila, but I am oh, yeah. so glad that there are people who are. I'm so glad. <laughs> oh, man, absolutely, right? Because it's like you're meeting people where they're vulnerable. Think about it as a server, bartender, you don't have the opportunity to build this giant rapport and relationship before you're having to upsell and talk about product. And so the ability to build familiarity and curiosity quickly, hire servers and bartenders to be your salespeople and your BDRs. They're incredible. And former teachers, wonderful professionals. I love it. I so love it. So you're you're one of the icons, female founder. You own your own company. Tell us what you're doing today. Oh, I am so lit up. So today we, well, let me go back. So in the pandemic, I got, I got fired up that women didn't have enough places to go that were a sacred container for their own development. And so that really got me jazzed. And that was when we started, she gets it. And she gets it is now taken off around the globe where women leaders, strong, capable, amazing women can go and have this sacred portal to be like, oh, these are the tough conversations I need to have with me, myself, and I. And I'm, I'm going to be a little provocative. I have grown up and I have played, despite my elementary school start, the rest of my career has been in a male-dominated industry. And so the majority of my mentors, my bosses have all been men. And so for me, it was like, where do women go to have a mentor, a coach, of a woman who kind of gets it. And so that's the She Gets It Foundation is that we're on a mission to advance the careers 
and the self-leadership of women around the globe. And it's taking off. So it lights me up. You can see I'm passionate about it. it it's what I'm fired up to do every single morning. It gets me out of, out of bed with zero, zero resistance. Oh my gosh, what a beautiful thing to start. Now, is it is it for any role, any industry? Like if, if, if somebody is listening, wants to get involved in that or become a part of that, how do they do it? Any role, any industry, any female identifying leader who says, I want to invest in myself. I know that the more that I lead myself well, the more I can lead others well. And then if you've got a very specific sales or marketing team, we can do training on that. But this is really, this is about self-development. That's sort of yeah. where my calling is. So my my background is all in communication. I'm the queen of magical phrases. I believe that life happens one conversation at a time. But I also believe that the most important conversations are the ones that you have with me, myself, and I. Oh, my God. You've, you're dropping so many incredible nuggets that I feel like I'm trying to memorize them all. I'm like, you are dropping <laughs> gold. But you're, you're, you're able to take these big, grandiose ideas that sometimes feel really, really overwhelming and say them in a way that feels digestible, which I think is what makes what you do and the content you provide approachable and feel like anybody is thinking, I can go and do that. I can invest in myself. And you're so right. The ability for women or anyone who identifies as female to have the right kind of mentorship and the comfort to do that and growing up in an environment where our emotions are celebrated. Our personalities are celebrated. We can approach the world fearlessly because our dreams can be achieved just like anybody else's. That still doesn't feel like it's always the way that things are. And women need to hear that message. We do. And I think that in a world that's as volatile as it is right now, where there's a lot of noise out there, we need a place to be able to go and say, okay, what's, what's my truth? And how do I own my truth? And how do I speak my truth? And how do I do it all confidently in a way that advances my career, my relationships, and my life? And I just, you know, the, the crazy thing was, is I was looking out at the world and I was like, I don't see it for myself. And if I don't see it for myself and I'm doing all of these things, then that's what I want to create. And, and I joke because, you know, we teach what we students need to learn. So it's all good. I mean, we learn while we teach, right? If I, oh, I often sure. tell people, if, if you really feel like you can't master that skill, you can't do that thing, grab somebody who's curious and try to teach them how to do it. And there's something about putting yourself in the mindset of, I don't know how to do it perfectly, but let me try to teach you how to do it where there's mutual learning happening there. It's a beautiful methodology. And that's a really nice philosophy that I have too, is that I'm a big believer that when we come to that teaching platform in an equitable position. So even though I might be the teacher, quote unquote, we're both students and, and we're both coming at the material together to expand our curiosity and to expand our capacity to play better. Oh, absolutely. And you hit on something too that I think is really meaningful and, and very, very timely is there's a lot going on in the world right now. And the majority of our listeners are likely sitting in a leadership role or a role where they have some sort of influence within the technology industry, which right now feels like it's a really tumultuous time. And we want to be able to have the right conversations. We want to be able to feel safe. But there's also this balance of I'm a sales leader in a revenue organization in an industry right now where things feel so unbelievably uncertain. And how do I balance being a leader and towing the company line, if you will, and, and making sure that I don't say the wrong thing, but also being approachable for my team and being honest with my team. So right now, in its most simplistic form, what kinds of conversations can leaders be having with their teams during times like these to really bring that human element? Well, we hear, we hear a lot about the word empathy. Yeah. And it's often a buzzword until we break it down. And what that really means is from an empathic intelligence that you're going to show up and you're going to listen perceptively. You're going to listen sensitively so that you can respond appropriately. And so that means that, yes, the onus is on you. But if you think about it, then you're asking, well, which conversations matter most right now? So it could be everything from the world is shifting. I, I joke, sh hashtag shift happens. So shift happens. But which, which of these shifts are relevant to us and which yes. of these shifts are relevant to our customers. So then how do we prioritize our focus areas and what it is that we want to do? Because you can't do it all. 
but are there legislative, economic, technology, geopolitical, or economic? Are there shifts in the world that you have to say, okay, these are most relevant for us, then how do we capitalize on them in a way that's best for the customers that we serve? And that's really, to me, sort of like the, the most important word in that question is service. You know, we, we don't just go out and, and we don't, I mean, I, I come from sales. I have a huge sales background. And it's like, I'm so tired of the, we're going to throw spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks, right? We're going to dial for dollars. Like all those brain old, pray, old brain right. pray. Yeah, Exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. All that stuff drives me crazy. And so to me, if you're really there to serve, if you're there to problem solve, if you're there to raise the critical thinking, then you're asking two questions. You know, what do we need to capitalize on for the best service for our customers? And then you need to ask yourself, and I love this question, who am I up to be? Or who do I need to become to lead through this season or to lead through these changes? And that's from all of my work with leaders for, gosh, the last 25 years, is that if you just focus on the number, you're not going to meet it. If you focus right. on who you need to become to lead into that number, you'll exceed it. Oh my gosh. You're also reminding me of this concept of, I often talk about it as executive empathy versus commiseration because I think <laughs> yeah. what what you're talking about actually is a muscle, right? It's a leadership muscle yes. where you have to very, very consciously understand that while you want to serve and achieve these things, by over-serving or accidentally commiserating, you could be hurting your people or hurting the company. And that could look like, you know, hey, when 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 we're going through tumultuous times, I'm in it with my team. I'm feeling the ups and downs. I'm saying, yeah, you're right. This isn't fair. We're going to fight through it. It often becomes this like, as a leader, I'm going to inspire my people to fight. And that can go south really, really quickly because who wants to work somewhere where you're just having to fight to get things done? That's right. And I think that that's, so one, it is a skill set. I absolutely yeah. agree with you. And I think that one of the things that the really, the really brilliant leaders do is they say, I hear you. I understand you. I am a witness to what it is that we're going through and I'm still your leader. So here's what we're going to do with resilience. Here's what we're going to do with realistic optimism. Now, not Pollyanna, oh, it's all going to be fine because I don't believe in that. I don't think it's all going right. to be fine. But here's, here's like a beautiful magical phrase. So let's say you and I are just talking, you know, girlfriend to girlfriend and you're going through something difficult. I am not over a glass of wine going to tell you, oh, Christina, you're going to be fine going to be fine because I don't know that you're going to be fine. But here's what I can do. I can flip the message to Christina. No matter what happens, I know you can face it. I know you can face it. And what I'm giving you is a message of strength and belief in your ability to be resilient and resourceful, to find the tools that you need. And then if the, uh, if the context is appropriate, then I would say to you and Christina, I'm here to face it with you. In mm -hmm. other words, I got your back. But what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to sit there. I'm going to be like, I know, woe is us. You know, the sky is falling. What are we going to do? And that's a very different mindset. It's a very different communication skill set. But it's also at the core that is fundamentally brilliant leadership. I've got a vision. I've got a mission. We are on a path. We are going to get there. It doesn't mean it's going to be rainbows and unicorns every day. But I believe in our ability to reach that new shore. Oh my gosh, you're you're making me think about the relationship between feelings and behavior and which yes. one we actually have the right to impact. So the other day, my son, who's four, about to turn five, comes home from preschool. I say comes home like he drives himself. Like I picked him up yeah. from preschool. I, I get it. No, I get it. He comes home. Yeah. And and I asked, you know, how how was school today? What did you do? And he says, Well, you know, so and so kept you know, taking my toy and then I was getting the wrong toy. And my teacher reminded me that you get what you get and you don't get upset. And at first I was like, oh, and then I was like, wait, no, you're allowed to get upset. I said, if somebody takes the toy that you want to play with, you can get upset about that. So now the feeling is you're upset. And hey, you know what? You can be upset. You can be mad. You can be scared. You can be happy. I'm never going to tell you you're not allowed to have a feeling, but what do you do with it? So when you're upset, you can either express that you're upset. You can go and take a walk. You can get a glass of water. You can scream into a pillow. You can't punch somebody. You can't right. 
put a hole into a wall. So it's the behavior that we do with the feelings. And what you're talking about is kind of that exact same thing where so many sales leaders and just people in general, things are tumultuous at the company. And you're, you're sitting there in your one-on-one and the person says like, oh, I'm mad about this and I'm upset and I'm frustrated. And our first instinct is to help by saying, well, don't be mad. Don't be frustrated. And instead, it's what you said, right? Hey, I feel the same way. We can feel like this. It's valid. But now what do we do with that? That's where leadership lives, in my opinion. Oh, we're, oh my gosh. I'm going to preach to the choir for a second. So this is so ironic that you... So we just had this discussion in our family. We laughed because we have a phrase with our kids. So I'm, I'm the cool aunt. I take pride in this. Oh, and yes. years ago when the kids were little, because my nieces and nephews are now older than your son by a long shot. But yeah. we used to have that expression at first too. It was like, you know, you get what you get and, you, and you're not upset. And I, and I remember sitting down with my brothers and my sister-in-law and I said, I'd love to change this phrase before we go any further, that you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. I said, yes. because they're allowed to have, feel what they're feeling. I mean, we are, we are two sisters from a different mister, Christina, because what I, what I don't want is the behavior choice, but yes. you're allowed to be human. And, and your initial, so I always say your initial reaction doesn't define you, but your response does. So you're allowed to be mad, upset, frustrated, disappointed. That's a reaction. That's human. What defines you then is what do I do with that? How do I behave? And so a lot of times, oh, God, I love this. A lot of times I'll say, okay, let's not do the calm down. You know, there's no need to be upset here, right? All these condescending, pedantic, judgmental comments. Let's Mm -hmm. change it with the opposite. And I would say to your son, hey, you sound frustrated or you sound Mm -hmm. upset. Am I hearing you accurately? Are you upset? And then he's like, yeah, I couldn't get my toy. And then I'm like, oh, that must have been like really frustrating. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, so then this is what we do with that. Mm -hmm. you know. And, And what's so fascinating about this is that people feel validated first and they have to feel validated if we want them to have long term behavioral change. So again, it goes right back full circle. You have to feel seen, heard, and understood before I can ask you to change your behavior. 100%. And I have to earn the right to earn your trust to impact you in that way. And this is something else that I think leaders at work can struggle with, especially newer leaders where I don't have the relationship with my team. We don't have that mutual trust. If you're a follower of Radical Candor, I haven't had the opportunity to show you yet that I care personally. And yet I'm coming into this company and I'm being told my job is to challenge you directly, give you feedback and make a change. And I think people can grapple with. So given the work that you do around communication for all of the new leaders in the world right now that feel like they are bearing the weight of having to shift their teams and give feedback without a relationship. Where do you think that they can start to make that comfortable and gain buy-in and respect without coming in, guns blazing, no relationship, I'm just going to shift everything around almost insensitively? There's, there's a couple things that I would, I would encourage people to consider. And one of them is to co-create all of your meetings with a question-based agenda. So what does that really look like? That looks like me, let's just say I'm the sales team leader and we've got five people on the team. So what I would do is I would send out that inclusive invite that says, hey, how might we fill in the blank? How might we make the new person a more integrated, successful team player? How might we shorten our sales cycle? How might we grow by 12%? How might we upsell to get rid of some old, whatever, whatever it is, it's a how might we, because that we is inclusive. It says your ideas matter, your voice matters. And notice that I've also reduced the burden. It's a might. We don't have to like, how do we solve? Nope. How might we? But then... I'm going to ask for your input in the form of questions. So in that email, I'm going to say, hey, Christina, what do you think we should be asking and answering in order to answer this question? You'll send me a question. Doug will send me a question. Samantha will send me a question. Raj will send me a question. We'll put this agenda together. And then the beauty of it is when we sit down for this conversation, whether it's a hybrid call or we're in person, it's not my meeting. It's our meeting. We've co-created this agenda to do a forward-focused, problem-solving conversation that says everybody's voice matters. We're going to harness the collective intelligence of the team. And by the way, this is what I love. This is the neurology geek in me. You've started to critically think before the meeting even started. So sales leaders who are listening right now, this is a jujitsu trick. If you really want to get your people to show up for a meeting and play full out, 
send them this question ahead of time, force them to participate by sending you a question, because by the time that the meeting starts, they're ready to play. They've been thinking about it in the back of their mind for hopefully at least, you know, 48 hours, if not more. Oh, you're taking us down a path now that I am going to follow. And that is going to make a bold statement here. But I would go so far as to say that a lot of internal meetings suck. Because, uh, yes, they right? do. And, and not bold only do they statement. suck, they suck the <laughs> marrow out of your yes. soul is what they do. They're, they're yes. soul sucking meetings. Yes. Yes. And that could be from your one on ones that you're holding to your team meetings where I I have held firm in my belief that one-on-ones and pipeline forecasting meetings need to be two very, very different things. Yes, and yet I keep absolutely. hearing sales leaders that even a one-on-one meeting, let's focus there for a moment. In my sure. opinion, a one-on-one with your direct report is not to sit down even from a sales capacity and say, okay, so let's open up your pipeline. Let's go deal by deal, right? That's what you're doing all the time. One-on-one time is I'm going to get to know you. You're going to get to know me. We're going to learn about your career goals. I'm going to coach you. I'm going to let you lead the agenda. But this is going to be a qualitative meeting where you have my absolute undivided attention. And I can actually start to show you that I care personally a little bit. The quantitative piece of the work that we do, we are doing that all the time. But this is your sacred time with me and my sacred time with you where we are doing meaningful qualitative work. Yet so many leaders don't follow that. It's, it's lazy thinking and it's lazy yeah. leadership to pull up any type of report, whether that's a dashboard or a spreadsheet, and to go through the numbers with somebody because it's just low-level recall. It's low-level data. There's no critical thinking in that. It's, it's the what does the data mean? How do we want to play differently from the data? So let's say I work for you. I would hope that you know, you're, you're my boss. You're brilliant. You're going to ask me to look at the information ahead of time. And here's what you want to do. You want to ask me to say, Amy Kay, what are the top three questions that you want us to explore together so that you can move forward more successfully? Well, I'm I'm going to come to my boss respectfully and say, Christina, I, I need your brain. I need your expertise. I need your wisdom. I need your experience. This is what I want to know. This is where I'm I'm seeing a gap. This is where I'm slowing down in my sales cycle, or this is where I'm not able to move something forward, or I'm just struggling to communicate the value of this product. I'm not being able to whatever, fill in the blank. But here's here's the difference. When you when you and I engage in a conversation at a level that's insightful, that's full of wisdom and exploration, what I call the bigger, better, better, bolder questions, then we're going to completely change my emotional state, my motivation my drivers, my behaviors. But if you want me to just sit and look at spreadsheets with you, that's a waste of everybody's time. That's right. 100%. And we glean nothing out of that that I can't ask you outside of this meeting. And I also think the delivery mechanism in these cases matters because any one-on-one time with your leader, whether it's your dedicated 30, 45, 60 minute, weekly, bi-weekly, whatever, one-on-one time, There's so much communication that happens outside of person to person. There's text messaging, there's emailing, there's slacking, there's salesforce.com chatter. And I often feel like for leaders, it can be a trap because we interpret messages based on the way that we communicate. And if you happen to be in nonverbal communication with someone who communicates differently, there can be a lot of misunderstandings that can impact relationships. So In a world that we are in where so much one-on-one time isn't spent face-to-face, what do you think are some landmines that leaders can avoid to not hurt the relationships with their direct reports? Well, let's let's backtrack and unpack that. So first of all, I want to make sure I'm crystal clear and I'm not misinterpreted. Data is important, but what's most important about the data is the meaning behind it. And so if you're, if you're, you know, in a world of big data, it's easy to get distracted by data points. You know, it's easy to get distracted by all of the tools. In fact, I had a gentleman the other day, he's like, I have 28, you know, KPIs on my dashboard. And I was like, oh my God, I'm exhausted just hearing that. It's too many. It's It's way too many. It's it's like, what? It's like, come on. And yet we try to be this like comprehensive, put our arms around it. And that's again, that's a default protective persona. Like I understand that psychologically. But what we need to do as leaders is take charge of, are my people focused on the right things with the right sense of urgency? Are they focused on the things that matter most? That, that you know, to say the trite, move the needle, but really yeah. and truly, 
It's also knowing who your individual is. And this is really important. I have fallen into the trap of trying to do it like somebody else. And the way that somebody else does it isn't always the way that it works best for the next person. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't share best practices, but what I'd rather do is hear, oh my gosh, Christina, you're having tremendous success with this. And you know, Mary's having tremendous success with that. Which of these pieces is going to fit my personality? Which of these pieces could I take and run with? And that's what leaders are helping to do is to maximize the capacity and the potential of each individual. And so I am going to say something provocative. Do it. Sales leaders that try to treat their team members equally will fail. If you treat your team members with equity, you will be wildly successful. You're going to have to break that down more because I'm I'm almost levitating out of my seat with joy. I'm on an air of joy, a gust of wind of joy, but I think a lot of people may not understand the difference. Can you break it down? Sure. Well, think about it with parenting. You've got, let's just say you have three kids. They're all going to be different personalities. They're all going to have their, their strengths. They're, you're going to love them all equally. But you can't parent equally because they need different things from the parent. And so you have to do it with equity, meaning what's best for this kid. So for instance, if you've got a kid that's a little bit messy, are you going to ride them for their entire life on, on, a, on a dirty room? Whereas maybe your battle needs to be, and I'm serious with this, with helping them to feel more creative and less depressed. Or maybe you need to work with them on being able to work on their study habits And you're going to come a little bit harder in that area with them. And so, again, I'm just sort of riffing. But the idea is that everybody has unique strengths. We want to leverage those strengths. Everybody has unique challenges. We want to support them. We want to be their ballast in that area, which means that as a leader, when you just say, well, I'm making this rule for everybody and I'm going to do this for everybody, you've got to be careful that it's not going to backfire. 100%. And... This is an area I want you to dig in. How does your relationship with that person impact your view of equity for them? It's everything. Yes. It's everything. It could be a trap, right? Because if you have a very, very close, friendly relationship with certain direct reports and not others, even if you're treating them equitably, the other folks in the team may view what you're doing as giving them a leg up or treating them unfairly, or she got that great account because she's friends with the boss, whereas you as the leader may be trying to to display that equitable behavior. But the the image of your relationship with people can be tricky. How do you, and that's a big question, I realize, I just throw a whopper at you, but how do you negotiate that then with relationship? It's transparency. It's direct yeah. communication. So I, I truly believe that life happens one conversation at a time. And I also believe that the quality of your life, the quality of your relationships is a direct reflection of the quality of those conversations. So it's being transparent. It's letting people know that you're showing up. Now, I, I lived in Shanghai, China for three years. So I want to I wanna share a cultural analogy. I was taught probably late 90s this wonderful concept of soft front, hard back. And what that means is I'm going to lean in with empathy. I'm going to communicate to connect with you as an individual, with you as as a, a member of my team, but I'm going to have a hard back, which means I'm going to have a boundary. I'm going to have something that is important to me and I'm going to play by the rules and my rules, right? The way that my game board looks. But here's the difference. What most leaders do, especially in sales, is we'll do the hard front So we'll be all boys. Nope, these are the rules. Treating everybody the same. And then people come to us after and like, yeah, but that doesn't work for me and I'm unique. And they're like, oh, okay, we'll change the rules for you. And we end up having this really soft spine. And then people walk all over us. It's the opposite. When you can lean into connect, when you can make a difference for somebody individually first and then have some boundaries where people can't walk all over you, meaning a tough spine, you get tremendous respect. And everybody starts to understand, oh, Christine is this amazing leader who's going to lean in. She knows what I need, but there are going to be some boundaries that we're not going to be able to walk over. I, I actually approached my very first leadership role in the way that you described with the, the hard front, soft back. And I think so many new leaders do that because they're masking the insecurity of, am I going to earn respect due to my newness with the hard exterior to try to earn that quick respect of, no, I'm a leader. 
I have to be tough and like guilty. I I absolutely did that. Yeah. And I do think there's a little bit of gender nuance here where I started to get a lot of feedback that I was unapproachable or I was cold or I was steamrolling. And, you know, and, and I was like, that is not at all how I want to come off. I am just trying to show that I can be taken seriously. It was really coming from insecurity and, and a lack of leadership training on how to show up with strength and not confuse that with aggression. And so many struggle with that, especially early on, but maybe they never let it go because they don't understand that they can. Well, there's, there's so many things that are contributing to that. So it's the idea of, if you think about the, the confluence of everything that you just said, we've got mixed messages for women in business. We've got a world that's often male dominated. And so in order to be successful, especially my generation, I'm generation X, you had to sort of play like one of the boys in order to be taken seriously. And yet what we're learning is that we can embrace our femininity. We don't have to apologize for being feminine while also asking and receiving respect. And so I think that we also have a double standard for, for women, especially that our, our assertiveness can get misinterpreted as bitchiness or aggressiveness. And so we have a lot of that kind of what I call noise and rhetoric in the background. But here's, here's the thing that I learned that I didn't carry on from my elementary school teaching days. So when I was teaching fifth grade, I started off pretty hard ass. It was sort of like there were rules and you were not going to break them so that by the spring, I could be pretty relaxed and still have control over 38 10-year-olds in my classroom. But if you start too soft, then they'll just walk all over you. And so what I had to learn in my own corporate journey was, oh, I do need to lean into connect. I do need to embrace my femininity and then have the hard spine. I don't need to start off quite so badass, you know, nope, I'm going to be, you know, super hard about this. And that was my learning journey. That was my learning curve that I think a lot of women relate to is that it's really tricky. And that's part of the, one of the things that I love working with women is I really want you to embrace your femininity and never apologize for it because you can absolutely be taken seriously and credit with credibility and respect and still be like, and I'm a girl. It's okay to be a girl. <laughs> right. It's, it's okay to be a girl. And hey, everybody, regardless of your gender identification, it's okay to have your feelings and it's okay to show your personality. Absolutely. And it's, it's okay to be vulnerable. Like the vulnerability and the fear of what does it mean if I am vulnerable? What does it mean as a female executive when I say, I don't know how to do that? That's a terrifying thing for women, but I would say anybody in an executive role to say is, you know what? I don't know because the assumption is I'm in this role because I'm supposed to know all of it. So that level of vulnerability and being humble, I think, actually makes you a better leader and you show people that it's okay to not have all the answers. Doesn't mean I'm not going to solve the problem. It means I acknowledge that I don't have the solution, but I'll own finding the solution. And that small shift can make big differences as well. Well, it's a huge shift in mindset. So it's yeah. the idea of, yes, if I come in and I'm like, oh, I have to know everything. No, you don't. You just have to be responsible for asking the questions to keep the problem solving moving forward. And if, And a lot of times I'll tell leaders, one of the most profound questions came from Socrates thousands of years ago when Socrates said, what am I missing? So even one of the most wisest you know, philosophers was, was the most vulnerable in saying, until we ask what I'm missing, we can't be wiser. And so that's just kind of that nice reminder of no matter how smart you think you are or how smart you want to be perceived, the smartest person in the room is going to be the one that says, I don't have it all figured out. Right. Right. Ugh. Well, this has been such a wonderful conversation. And on the topic of vulnerability, what a weird setup. Let's do the rapid reveal. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's, let's open up some vulnerability. All right. So with our rapid reveal section, I have three questions for you. We have 60 seconds or less to answer each if you okay. are ready. I'm ready. All right. Number one, what would your ideal day be? Paint the picture. Well, we're talking B2B, so I'm going to use that as my acronym, B2B, only here's how I would describe it. My ideal day would be B, books, because I'm a nerd and I love to read. My two would be for H2O, water, so I'm on the coast or I'm on a boat. And then the last B would be for bubbles, because I love my champagne. So my yes. ideal day would be reading, water, and champagne. So B2B. Okay, you need to just go spend the day at a spa and get all, like, bring the pack of books, sit at a spa. It's your ideal day. I love it. 
completely switching gears. Number okay. two, what is an irrational fear of yours? Being forced into a career of politics. I, oh. I have I have this fear because a lot of people are like, oh, you know, Amy Kay, you're so extroverted, like you should go into politics. And I'm like, I'm like, no, I, I have no desire, right? But I have this irrational fear that one day I'm going to wake up and they're going to look at me like the they, whoever the big they is. And they're like, there's they. only one job left in the world for you, Amy Kay. <laughs> you must go into politics. And I'll be like, oh, no. No, then they're like, you know, you're going to go into politics and you're going to starve. And I'll be like, oh, no, I'm going to starve. <laughs> you're going to be picked apart. No one's going to oh, like you. Oh, my uh, gosh. Yeah, that's an irrational yeah. fear. Oh, God, I might share that one. I have so many irrational fears, which is why I ask this question all the time, is I just love hearing about what are the things that just keep us up at night that are kind of wild. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> It's true. <laughs> yeah. And now number three, and you can't include anything that you just said in the last 40 minutes because that okay. would be too easy. But number right. three, what is the last advice that you gave to someone? Oh, that was just yesterday. So yes. I was on a coaching call yesterday and I said, you have to say no to the nonsense. So I have one of my favorite phrases of all time is not me circus, not me monkeys. And you have to say it with that accent because that's how it was given yeah. to me. So yeah. I was doing a round table of CEOs in Ireland. So we were in Northern Ireland and this gentleman shared an expression. God, we're going back a long time ago, but he shared an Do expression it. with me and he was like, not me circus, not me monkeys. And I've, I've never been able to say it any other way since then. So yesterday I'm on a coaching call and this woman was just like, I don't know what to think. And I'm like, oh, say no to the nonsense. Say no to the nonsense. Not me circus, not me monkeys. <laughs> This is, I mean, I'm probably going to use that. I will also cite you because I'm a big believer in giving people their credit, but that's wonderful. Oh, it's, it's um, one of my near and dear expressions. So yes, you, you're welcome to use it and share the love. <laughs> I'm going to practice it with the accent before I do it on the air, but maybe I'll drop it in a future episode and then be like, this was an Amy K thing that changed me. As I mentioned, this has been such a wonderful conversation. You're doing amazingly meaningful work, I would say for everybody, but especially for women, for leaders, if folks want to find you, learn about you, connect with you, where can they find you? Oh, super easy. And thank you. That was very kind of you to offer. So two really easy ways. One, you can go to amyk.com and Amy K is four letters, A-M-Y-K. So you can get all, and by the way, get all kinds of free resources from us. I believe in that. If you are a woman leader, you can go to she gets it dot com. Again, tons of free tools and resources. And again, all kinds of coaching, training, our inner circle. And I would love to partner with you if it makes sense for you, because I also believe in synergy. But thanks for asking, Christina. Absolutely. And Amy Kay, thank you for the incredible work that you are doing for women and professional women. It's so, so needed. And it's dear to my heart. It's dear to your heart. So I just want to lay out a thank you for the work and the passion that you have for elevating the folks around us. It's incredibly meaningful. Oh, thank you. So from my heart to yours, hugs. This has been a joy. That's right. Wonderful. And we will see all of you next time on Taking the Lead. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Taking the Lead. If you're looking for more inspiring stories from women leaders in B2B tech, then visit us at motionagency.io slash taking the lead.